It is my honor to introduce to you Jasmine Henry as our next speaker. Jasmine is going to be speaking to us about asset inventory, the importance of it and its impact on attack surfaces. And Jasmine is also the security director at Jupiter One. She has a master's in informatics and analytics, and she has a specialization in knowledge graphs for cloud native security. Jasmine, please. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I feel really honored to have um, some folks in the audience. I know there's a lot going on in Vegas between uh, B Sides, Black Hat, Diana Initiative, uh, multiple tracks. Um, I am Jasmine Henry, and I'm going to be sharing some research I did uh, this year on asset inventory, attack surfaces, and attack paths. Um, I am security director at Jupiter One. Um, my background is in analytics. I'm going to be finishing my PhD this year in data quality. Um, and my specialization, it wasn't really intentional, but I've kind of developed this career specialty in using graphs uh, for security at cloud native startups is a lot of the work I do. Uh, the role I'm in now involves a blend of research and security. Um, I have to kind of balance the research I really enjoy with uh, pragmatic things like passing audits. Um, I have had this hair color for years and years, so I'm pretty easy to recognize at conferences. Please say hello. Um, and I am a fan of women's professional basketball. A lot of times when I say that at conferences, people laugh, which is great. Um, this is kind of an icebreaker. So today I'm going to be sharing, I'm going to give an overview of the research, the data I used, uh, key findings, which in the interest of making this not too dry, I'm, I'm kind of posing my findings as, as discussion. So I think a lot of times uh, what we discover is more questions. I'm actually going to give you a preview of the newest research I'm working on that's kind of in its uh, very nascent stages. And then uh, what I'm going to be working on next. My goal very much today is to give a technical talk that is accessible for everybody. Um, and I would really in appreciate feedback on how I did toward that goal, um, which I would encourage everybody for every talk you attend this week fill out uh, speaker feedback. It's really good community citizenship. Giving talks is hard, and I think that all of us want to improve. Um, so I would love to know how I did it at making this information um, accessible to all. So just kind of an overview of, of what I found. The average organization today has a total of 165,000 cyber assets for every security team. That is a much higher number than in the past. I had a grad school professor who worked at, I think it was General Motors, he never really said, but it was one of the big automotive companies um, in the, in the mid-80s. <clears throat> and his job was to walk the halls because they had about maybe 5% or 10% of their employees use computers at that point in time. And his job was to, to walk around wearing a belt bag that had floppy disks in it because these computers needed to be uh, like reformatted completely pretty often. And if you think about that, where a single employee could carry around floppy disks for all of General Motors computers on their body and where we are today, uh, 30, 35 years later, there has been a tremendous change. Um, the majority of assets in the enterprise today are data assets. There's users, which are not true users, that's user identities. A single user may have hundreds of identities. We have a number of applications that is growing very quickly. Uh, network assets. That said, I feel like the term network has not aged particularly well. What is a network? Um, as, I, as I discovered in this research, a network is really often static cloud components. Um, companies have one or two physical networks and then a lot of cloud uh, infrastructure that's incredibly dynamic. Um, and then devices, which include both user laptops, couple, you know, cell phones, uh, tablets, and then a whole bunch of cloud hosts. And in addition to all of these cyber assets, there's nearly an equal number of security findings. There's almost a one-to-one -one ratio of cyber assets to security findings that are unresolved and a much smaller number of policies. So you can kind of think of the findings and the, and the policies as attributes of these cyber assets. Um, and in the case of you know, findings, they may create some liability, some risk around these assets. In the case of policy, hopefully they create appropriate guardrails. So just kind of to show you the data I was working with, um, I had data on 
1,270 organizations for the first part of this research. Second part of the research, that number goes up to about 2,700. Uh, these are organizations that have allowed me to use this data. They've opted in. Um, and by the time the data gets to me, it's extremely sanitized. I, I can't really tell a ton of characteristics about individual companies when I'm working with this amount of data at a high, you know, high scale. So 1,270 organizations. In total, there was 372 million data points, 210 million cyber assets, 162 million asset attributes. And then you can kind of see the breakdown from there, which is a reflection of the prior slide. Um, all of this data was in a knowledge graph, which is a, a graph that shows the relationships between assets and, and attributes um, using a graph model to kind of classify and categorize um, these, these entities. Really quick, uh, last boring slide. I wanted to share a couple key terminology and concepts for individuals who are new to graphs. Um, cyber asset, uh, I kind of shared that's devices, user identities, um, networks, data, and, and so on. The relationships between these devices, those can model dependencies. So it, as a user, you probably have access to Slack, to, to uh, email. Um, so that would be a permissive relationship between that user identity and that application. Um, particularly in cloud environments and CICD pipelines, relationships can get very, very complicated. If you think about the number of conditions and rules that companies can have set up over their, their CICD pipeline, it can be in the thousands. Um, you know, what can actually trigger uh, the pipeline uh, to, to move automatically? It can depend on thousands of factors that are configurations, they can be services, and so on. And so a graph data model, which is what you see on the left, has two components, uh, which are the nodes, those are the circles, and the edges are the lines, and those are relationships. And the circles are the assets. Um, I can come back to this at the end if anybody has any questions, but it kind of shows um, how I chose to group assets within the super classes. Uh, decisions had to be made. Again, I feel like terms like network have not aged particularly well. Um, but for the sake of consistency, this is kind of the, the data model I built for analysis. So the first finding from this research that I want to kind of emphasize is the fact that security teams are more fatigued and understaffed than I realized. Um, the average security organization has 120,561 uh, findings and backlog. And when I tell that number to other security people, I get one of two reactions. I either hear, yup, or that seems low. <laughs> and I feel like that's not healthy. Um, there is a written report behind this research at this point. If you, if you want to go dig it up, you, you may. And I kind of go on a diatribe. You know, I, I think about a world where product engineers had 120,000 JIRA tickets in queue. Um, I feel like they would raise their middle finger and go get a different job. Um, I feel like this is not normal. It's not psychologically healthy, but that is the state of security findings at our organizations, the majority of which are coming from cloud security tools, Amazon Inspector, services are running over cloud detecting drift or uh, you know security risks in real time or vulnerability scanners which are often typically cloud as well um, but sometimes can be code and i think that you know this is obviously a, a negative and concerning thing but i think it's important to ask ourselves why are cloud findings occurring so frequently um, you know, something else I, I, I observed in my research is the average cloud security finding is 383 days old, which is almost 14 months. And I feel like that's particularly interesting when you compare it to data from, from Gusto, a payroll provider, that indicates that the average employee job tenure at this point in time is seven months. So cloud findings are nearly twice as old as employees. Um, I think that we are absolutely in the dark ages of cloud anomaly detection. I think that we have some models that work pretty well at, at detecting anomalies on-prem on in traditional infrastructure and, you know, physical servers and physical networks. But I think that we really don't have the ability to accurately understand contextual dependencies in a cloud environment. 
uh, because again, there's a ton, ton of conditions that can surround whether something is actually um, an issue. And there's also, um, my research has indicated that cloud environments are highly unbounded, which means they're incredibly chaotic compared to the technologies that my, my grad school professor was using in the 80s at General Motors. Um, in our experience, do findings effectively surface risk? In my experience, no. You know, there's been times when I've chosen to mute Slack feeds from Amazon Inspector because it's so much drivel. And what that inevitably means is that one finding will come through that actually is an issue, and maybe it's an hour or two before I notice it. And I think that um, I think there's a lot of work to be done, and it gives me kind of a, a sense of mental peace to understand that like this work is untenable. Nobody can get to the bottom of their backlogs. Um, everybody is completely overwhelmed. However, um, I think that there's a lot of work to be done on how we identify issues, and also we really need to start taking an automation first approach to how we solve every problem. Uh, the next area I looked at was the proportion of cloud to traditional infrastructure, which traditional may be laptops, um, it can be on-prem servers, it can be um, physical networks. Uh, very unsurprisingly, there is basically nine cloud devices, cloud hosts for every single physical device in today's organization on average. Um, something that actually really did surprise me was the incredible ratio of cloud networks to physical networks and what that means for network security, because these cloud networks are way more dynamic than what we've really been trained to secure. Um, the ratio of devices to employees was another finding that surprised me. That's, that's on average. And that doesn't mean that people have 110 laptops apiece. It means that um, there's just a ton of cloud devices, way more than IoT in the, uh, the organizations in this data. And that creates a huge burden for security teams. Uh, there's an ISC2 study that shows that um, security is typically about half of a percent of headcounts, so one security person for every 200 employees. So the average security person is dealing with thousands and thousands of devices that they are responsible for securing. And again, just an incredible ratio of findings are cloud-driven. When you look into the, uh, the topology of, of network assets, I was, was really um, surprised at the amount of network interfaces in domain records and like what an incredible proportion they were to static IPs. So I feel like it's important to think about uh, what it could look like to, to do security at this scale. Um, it's a new reality, but I don't think that it's ever going to go back to where we were a decade ago or 20 years ago. Um, I feel like we're at a pretty interesting point in the industry where we don't really have a way to manage such an enormous amount of assets, to manage such enormous attack surfaces. But at the same time, we kind of it's kind of imperative that we figure it out. Um, I, I feel like since the onset of COVID, and there's actually some research from Harvard Business Analytics that showed that at the onset of COVID, organizations had to stand up telemedicine overnight. They had to stand up uh, remote payment overnight. And before COVID, these would have been often six to 18 month development cycles. However, they were done overnight during COVID. Um, and that has created a situation where, where executives expect us to develop um, new features much, much more quickly and aren't really comfortable with us kind of slowing back down. That's had a profound effect on security teams where we don't have as much visibility into things before they're deployed to production. You know, I think that if security is looking at every piece of code before it's, it's deployed, it either means that you're kind of overinvested in security or that you're, you're really slowing down product. Um, so I think that we, as an industry, as professionals, have to kind of understand uh, what it actually means to shift left in a very new scenario. Um, I suspect strongly that we need to embed security into developer platforms. Like we need a lot of innovation in that area. Like does the average developer 
need to be making decisions every time about whether things should be encrypted in production? Probably not. That's probably an absolute, like everything should be encrypted. Um, so being able to kind of abstract those decisions about security away from engineers, um, maybe one of the things we need to do next. And I also think that as an industry, we need to have kind of honest conversations about how much our attack surfaces, about how much security has changed and what it really means for skill and talent. You know, I don't truly think that there is a talent gap. I think there's a talent mismatch where there's a lot of willing um, entry-level talent, uh, career switchers who want to do security. And there's a lot of mid-level and senior-level job postings, and a lot of job postings with kind of unreasonable expectations. And I think that um, we really need to try to align and look at you know, perhaps new vocational training paths that focus on cloud, because there's a huge need for cloud skill. Um, this is one of the last areas I'm going to kind of touch on in this, uh, this research, which I think everybody here has heard about uh, Log4j, which is a really significant moment in kind of security history, our collective history. Um, I think it was the first moment where the average executive, the average CEO, somebody who's not from a technical background, understood the risk that third-party code could create. And it was coming in a year where we had the... Uh, uh, solar ones, we had the Colonial Pipeline, where the average member of the public even started to understand this concept of supply chain risk. And one of the things I looked into in this research was our dependence on third-party code. That's code that's not written in our organizations. It's code that may be from open source libraries, such as Node.js or any number of other things. And I discovered that over 91% of code is third-party code. Uh, there is a huge ratio of application assets to humans, and proportionately, we're really just writing a tiny, tiny proportion of our code in-house. There is a really famous 1980s computer science paper um, that says, and I believe this to be, you know, firmly believe this to be true, that you cannot trust code you can't, that you didn't write yourself. Fundamentally, that is true. Um, however, <laughs> most, most of our code is not written in-house. Um, I think that we need to realize that the kind of third-party code situation is unmanageable. This is a huge, massive attack surface that we cannot fully control. And what I think we can do is be honest with our leadership about this is how much third-party code we have and uh, push for additional personnel, as well as uh, tools to create visibility. There's really no simple or complicated solutions to the supply chain uh, code crisis currently. Uh, I think there are tools such as knowledge graphs, like I was using for this research, software build materials. Um, and the other thing I would point to is that if you have systems that take a huge amount of time and resources to keep them running, then they're not adding a lot of value, and they have a ton of third-party code, probably talk to your, to your leadership about into life. Um, you know, I think that the best thing you can do if there's no other options is to identify which systems are ready for end of life procedures. And that's probably conversations that we're not having between security people enough. I lied, I had one more area of key findings. Uh, so another area I looked at is the policy as code landscape which again, there was a ratio of about um, 8 million policies to 160, uh, sorry, 8,000 policies to 160,000 cyber assets at the average or mean organization. The majority of that policy is, policy is code, it's, it's cloud policy, uh, quite a few identity and access management policies as well, uh, rule sets, procedures, and standards. And I think that the ratio of 8,000 policies to 160,000 cyber assets, which is one to 19, is not actually that interesting or meaningful of a number. Um, I think that we actually eventually want to have a smaller number of policies as the number of cyber assets grow. Um, policy administration at cloud scale is very difficult, and we need to figure out ways to make it easier. And probably the most important way to do that is to figure out how to measure and monitor our 
policy coverage over our cyber assets. Ideally, you know, a single policy statement could cover tens of thousands of assets. And so what we want to understand is how efficient we're being, as well as what percentage of our attack surface is not covered by policy. Um, I did some looking into uh, asset relationships, which you know is, is kind of displayed in the graph to understand um, relationships between assets. And I also looked at the way the security practitioners at those 1,270 organizations were querying and measuring um, their security data. And I discovered that there's a lot of queries that, that are asking what they have, but not a lot of queries to understand relationships which is a pretty clear indicator that, again, we're overwhelmed and we don't have a ton of time bandwidth mental energy to look deeper into risks. Um, so I'm going to summarize kind of the first part of my research and then I'm going to jump into some, some stuff I'm working on currently. Um, the 2022 State of Cyber Assets report is available online. It's free. Um, and you know, based on this, this research, I kind of concluded that as automated asset inventory is mandatory. If anybody is trying to uh, inventory their assets using spreadsheets, Google spreadsheets or, or similar, it's gonna be really difficult, particularly for cloud. Um, and I think that we also need to push back on our vendors, our, you know, our auditors. If they're coming to us and saying, give me this evidence in spreadsheet form, um, I think that we need to kind of push back and educate them on tools that work better for environments and requirements. It, it is up to us to, to educate our leadership and, and our auditors on the realities of our cloud native security environments. I think that this research really revealed how much digital transformation has changed everything in the past few years since the onset of COVID. Uh, there's a ton of evidence of these highly dynamic cloud network services, microservices uh, that really show that we're architecting for flexibility for fast development. Um, and that's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. A huge kind of conclusion in this research was the importance of cyber asset relationships and dependencies to, to really manage risk. If we're gonna have 120,000 findings, the only way to know what's important, because you can't do all of those things, the only way to really know what's important is to understand which of those risks um, have the most connections and dependencies. What is the blast radius? So um, I kind of resolved to do additional research on that. And I was also kind of struck by the enormous gap between reality and, and what security practitioners are querying. So really quick, I've got three slides on this. Um, this is the research I'm working on currently. It's called the ASAP, which stands for Attack Surfaces and Paths. And I'm at uh, 2,300 organizations in this data set. Um, and 880 million triplets, which a triplet is a unique occurrence of two nodes on one edge. So Jasmine, the user, accesses Gmail would be a triplet. Uh, there's a really famous quote from John Lambert, who is a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, that says, uh, attackers think in graphs, defenders think in lists. As long as that's true, defenders win. And I feel like I'm somebody who's always challenged what I'm told to do, challenged what I'm told to think. Um, and while I do think that we need graphs, I don't think it's as simple as always win, always lose. I think that, that attackers have a much easier time with graph-based thinking because they kind of just try attack paths until something works, until something sticks to the wall, whereas defenders have to defend every node. I think that we need to be realistic about what it means uh, to be a defender in today's cloud native environments. Um, and I was also interested in you know, how dynamic are attack surfaces and paths. I ran an algorithm to understand how far assets are from the, the public internet, which was really computationally intensive. This was days of things not working <laughs> until something uh, finally worked. Um, and I was really surprised at this distribution. Uh, many of you probably heard of six degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon or you know, Facebook's four degrees where you have enough connecting relationships that you'll eventually get to to Kevin Bacon. And I think that there had been some kind of light assumption that our environments had a similar kind of six degree distribution. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, less than 1%, so 0.2% of assets are 
directly connect to the internet. That's largely API gateways and firewalls. Um, and then you can see the distribution from there. So the majority of assets are three to seven degrees away from the internet. And then there was this really interesting spike um, at about nine degrees from the internet. I've, since this, um, I have spent weeks kind of ripping out and redoing my attack service logic because, for example, users are typically going to be either four or five degrees away from the internet because you're accessing the internet um, typically through a laptop, through an identity. Uh, you probably have like a antivirus and a firewall on your laptop and then Chrome application. So you're going to be about number five, but that's really an indirect uh, connection to the internet because users typically have the potential to cause enormous damage. So path length is not everything. It's one measure, and I think it's an interesting one. Um, and attack surface logic is incredibly complex. This is something that really surprised and interested me. So the first thing I did was I looked at path lengths at kind of newer, more sophisticated organizations versus um, organizations that were much older. In particular, I looked at um, path lengths at a kind of new fintech company versus a very, very old media company. And I found that the media company had much longer and more complicated attack paths. And I ran that a couple more times, kind of comparing organizations like that to see if there was any correlation between um, cloud native status, between age of the organization, between industry and path lengths. And the or only correlation I found was that older um, organizations and less technical, if you will, industries had longer path lengths. I then looked at critical asset paths versus the attack paths of all assets, defining critical as host data source functions, logs, and code repositories, and found that critical asset paths are a lot more consistent than less important assets, which typically the host data stores functions and code repositories are gonna be assets that are very, very interesting to attackers. Uh, they're also very important to defenders. And that really threw me for a loop, and I thought about it for a few days. I hypothesized that we are more consistent with the assets that matter. We treat them with better consistency, we have more process around them, and things are less likely to slip through the cracks. And what that means is their path lengths are shorter, they're more predictable. And I don't think that's inherently bad, but I think it's an important thing to be aware of. I think that we need to be aware of areas in our security practice where we are consistent because it's the right thing to do, but it makes it easier for attackers to uh, you know, predict where something might be, where they can find your, your code repositories, where they can find your hosts. Um, and we need to think of ways that we can compensate for this um, by making it less predictable for attackers. Uh, one such example would be, um, excuse me, ephemeral architecture techniques uh, where maybe um, your cloud hosts die after a day. They're kind of regenerated uh, because then it's very hard for an attacker to, to predict that it'll be there for weeks on end. This is the very last quantitative slide I have, which is a final measure I did on local and global risk exposure. So local uh, risk exposure is first degree relationships between an asset and risk. So a good example of that would be you have a cloud host and I don't know, Qualys or something says your, your vulnerability scanner or your security service says, okay, this cloud host has 30 uh, vulnerabilities that need to be fixed. That would be the local risk exposure. Global risk exposure is a measure of vulnerabilities along the attack path. So if that vulnerable cloud host is connected to a user that's failed a phishing test and it's connected to um, an application that like is not protected with MFA um, with multi-factor authentication to secure it, um, and you've got a data store that's exposed the internet, that would be global risk exposure. And I feel like this is the most interesting measure I'm currently playing with and currently doing research on. Um, and a couple points here. I think that traditionally when you're looking at kind of introduction to knowledge graphs for security, there's a lot of advice to um, be worried about connectivity. So if, a, if an asset has a bunch of connections, I think that traditionally we've been advised to just kind of get rid of it. And I don't think it's that simple. Um, an identity and access management policy should probably have a ton of connections, and that's not something you just want to delete. 
I think that local and global risk exposure are a lot more um, interesting. If something has high local risk exposure, but low global risk exposure, a lot of times that's a sign that you're doing pretty well. Um, for example, data stores. I think that those have a lot of vulnerabilities, but we've minimized the risky paths around them as, as defenders in, in aggregate, and that's, that's a really good sign. If something has low local risk exposure and high global risk exposure, that can be a sign as defenders that we need to, to zoom in uh, to figure out what's going on and kind of take those contextual factors into account and, and identify whether we want to add controls, whether we want to get rid of the asset or, or what we can do. And for an attacker, high local and high global risk exposure, good example being hosts, um, are typically their favorite conditions because they can try any number of paths and they're very likely to be successful. Um, again, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, everybody. We didn't. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I do have uh, a Discord question for you. Awesome. They would like to know if you could speak a bit more, please, about how to reduce the numbers of policies and also a bit more about the types of policies that you were referencing. Yeah. Great. So, um, I am looking in, in my policy analysis that I shared today, um, I was looking at, again, uh, about 1,300 organizations' policies. Um, knowledge graphs are essentially models uh, that categorize things. So um, when these, these organizations are using the graph, um, their policies from, from Amazon Web Services, from Azure, which is another cloud provider, um, and from Google Cloud Policy, as well as, um, you know, typically Okta, which is an identity service, um, are kind of recognized by our uh, graph model as being policies. So standards are a tiny percentage, um, and then there's another category for other, but the, the large majority is, is cloud policy, which is gonna be policies that are set in, in Amazon or Google or Azure to govern your, your cloud users, your cloud data, your cloud devices. And then there's a bunch of IAM policies, which are gonna be either from those same cloud providers or also from your identity service, which might be, uh, you know, Okta was an example I gave, um, or your whatever SSO you're using to sign into both uh, cloud and other resources as well. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Does anybody in the audience have a question or a thought they want to share with regard to asset management or concerns with cloud security related? Great. Hi. Hi, so loved your talk. Um, I could talk about stuff all day. I had a couple of questions. Yeah. I'll chain them and let you handle them any way you want. Um, could you tell us a bit more about how you dealt with asset sameness and uniqueness identity in, in the sort of top level of it? And at the back end, I'd love to hear more about global risk and measurement of exposure along the attack chain and what what chain you're computing from the attacker on that. Basis. Yeah, great question. So um, can I ask kind of two clarifying questions really quick? I think we've got enough audio. Uh, when you say sameness, are you talking about entity resolution? Yeah, so um, it's hard. It is hard. There's a lot of really uh, crappy, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I feel like there, a lot of what we do in security um, is in its infancy. Um, I think there's a lot of graph models that are not where they need to be. Um, I can say that my organization, so the graph model that I'm kind of using for this research, we have an open source version, so I'm not hustling our product on anybody. You can go on GitHub, uh, play with it over Neo4j if you want. We have uh, teams of people who maintain it. Um, it's inherently best to use graphs if you're trying to map things that are changing, but at the same time, you have to maintain the model to accurately capture those changes. Really good example is that in the last week, uh, Sneak, which is a really 
uh, common vulnerability scanner changed how they're aggregating their findings. So we had to update our model accordingly. Um, so something I'm going to be working on over the next year, nobody is really currently able to quantify how accurate their graphs are. Um, so two things I'm going to be working on toward that end, towards the sameness, towards the entity resolution, is setting up known good environments um, to, and then constant sampling, automated sampling. Um, to maintain a quantitative measure of quality in our graph. Um, I apologize, what was the other question? <laughs> yeah, um, so the first thing we did there, uh, which this was in, uh, in partnership with our engineering data science team, was we measured connectivity. We actually used PageRank algorithm for connectivity, um, and there's actually a couple really good academic papers. I can share links in Discord later today that talk about local and global risk exposure. These are not necessarily concepts that are even limited to security. Um, they are measures of community risk within graphs. Um, so again, local risk exposure is first degree security findings, findings identified as CVEs, and then the global is CVEs along paths. Uh, which is both algorithmic measures. Um, there are some flaws here. Users are not typically going to have a lot of CVEs uh, because we have no way of measuring user risk aside from like phishing uh, simulations, things like that. Uh, cloud hosts are going to have a disproportionate amount of CVEs because our scanners scream at us all the time. Um, but it's it's an attempt. Yes. Yep. Yeah, assuming assuming that their organization has integrated that with the graph, yes, it would be it would be there. Good questions. Any other questions or interest? Um, I would love to ask on behalf of uh, students or people new to this industry who would be interested in trying this. What are some of the uh, the skills or paths that could lead you into doing this kind of work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so before I went to grad school, um, I started playing with an open source graph tool called Neo4j. Um, and I would definitely recommend doing, doing the same. You know, I think that in a broader sense, not just knowledge graph, but security analytics, um, I think that Splunk is a really well-known, widely adopted um, tool for, for kind of security analytics. They have a certification that I think costs a hundred bucks. You know, I have, um, I'm not comfortable recommending some of the security search to students that are like $9,000, hundred bucks is a lot more manageable. So I would recommend kind of Splunk, also free Splunk trainings. Um, I think those are very transferable skills to employers. And then finally, um, AWS has a lot of really low cost training, same with Azure, same with, with Google Cloud. Um, they have options that are free for students, if you look into it, and they also have um, options to free for vets. So I would recommend kind of entry-level uh, cloud provider certs as another way to, to develop some of those skills. Thank you so much. That's terrific. All right. Thank you all. Oh, wonderful. Here, let me come to you. Great talk, thank you. I was interested in your statistics around security folks versus devices. Yeah. And it's I, I was surprised it does seem low. Yeah. Uh, I work in the, uh, the vehicle industry, so our devices are millions. Um, like what, do, did you come up with a sweet spot? Yeah, so I'm actually looking, I've got some, some slides in the very back here that I don't typically uh, bring out unless somebody asks a really fantastic question like this. So, um, as I mentioned, I don't have access to a ton of identifying information. We're very, very careful about privacy. This is companies that have opted in. I have firmographics for about 8% of my data set, which is not much. Um, I don't know what to do. It's normally just a drill. I apologize, guys. It happens every Apparently a false alarm. Um, we protected human health and safety, just like ISCTO asked us to. Um, but we're back, so thank you for attending. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>